Is your heart wax gross? Are your ears dull of hearing? Are your eyes closed? In a way, the parable of the sower is a parable about parables. The variable throughout the account is the condition of our hearts. Are we prepared to hear, understand, and act upon His Word? With prepared hearts, we will come to understand Christ's parables and their crucial relevance to the growth and destiny of God's kingdom in our day. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. My spiritual preparations help me a lot of times, especially when I'm helping others. I've seen um, how I've remembered scriptures, whether that have been like my morning study or things from months past or even experiences I had back in my youth time. And it's really awesome to see how the Holy Ghost can um, help me in those ways, especially when I'm helping others. It's really a daily thing for me and um, just making sure I'm taking time to have those quiet moments and to reading my scriptures and saying my prayers, all the really simple things. But I find when I'm doing those daily things that helps me be ready to receive His Word. The way that I prepare myself to have God's Word is to just do those simple things in life by saying my prayers, reading the scriptures, and going to church. I believe that now in my life, especially in the seasons of my life, especially with this Come Follow Me program, Come Follow Up program, preparation is the key. It provides you the commitment, the foresight, and just being able to express yourself and to feel the Spirit. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Lomu, and I'm your host. Our Gospel Scholar for today is our good friend, Patrick Mason. Patrick is an author and a professor of religious studies and history at Utah State University. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, Ben. Good to be here. And seated next to Patrick, uh, we have Larry and Jen Monson as our special guests for today. Larry and Jen have five children and four grandchildren. They live in Sandy, Utah, where Larry is the stake president of the Sandy Central Stake. Their stake helps manage a church farm called the Sandy Vegetable Project. Welcome, brother and sister Monson. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Thanks. And we're also joined by our live studio audience. Thank you for joining us. And to the viewers at home, we're so happy to have you joining us today for our discussion. Please follow along and share your thoughts with us on any of our social media platforms. Today, we've selected two topics to discuss that relate to passages found in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapters 8 and 13. These topics and discussions support and build upon the Come Follow Me resource developed and published by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The two topics we are going to discuss today are first, my heart must be prepared to receive the Word of God, and second, Jesus' parables help me understand the growth and destiny of His Church. After exploring these two topics with our panel and studio audience, we'll dive deeper with Patrick, Larry, and Jen in the footnotes portion of the show. Okay, so Patrick, as we jump into this first topic, my heart must be prepared to receive the Word of God. What kind of context can you give us in general about these chapters we're studying today, and then specifically how this topic fits in? Yeah, so we're in the middle of Jesus's ministry, and he's preaching mostly around the Sea of Galilee. We call it the Galilean ministry. And in this particular chapter, especially Matthew chapter 13, talks about how he comes out, there's a big crowd. He started to attract more people because of the miracles he's done, because of the teaching. And so it says that he goes out into a boat, kind of right off the shore, to be able to, to, to preach to people. And this is one of the big kind of sermons or discourses in, in the Gospel of Matthew, and where he gives us a ton of different parables. So, Brother and Sister Monson, as we jump into talking about parables, what are some of your thoughts on the Savior's teaching method of using parables? I think this is a great teaching method because it allows us, as the listener, to listen with our hearts, with our ears, and try and determine what He is saying to us in particular. Not necessarily to the entire group, but what is He saying to me? And I think that is a great method that he uses to teach each and every one of us individually and collectively. Sister Monson? And I think each of us will come home with a different takeaway, you know, because it, the Spirit speaks to each of us differently. And usually with the parables, 
it's something that the people are familiar with. And so they then can liken it into their life and figure out what changes they need to make and how they can grow closer. Well, I'm excited to hear how you've made some of these connections with the way the Savior teaches. So Patrick, let's jump in and talk about, yeah. uh, just in general, some of the, the parables and specifically the first one the Savior shares in chapter 13. Yeah, so the first one is called the parable of the sower. And it starts in verse three. Again, this multitude is gathered. He's out on a ship and, and he's preaching to, to all these people. And it says, and he spake many things unto them in parables saying, behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And then he closes with, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Sort of like you were saying. I mean, yeah. the parables allow us to kind of get different meaning out of it based on what we're able to understand. So I would love to go to the audience and just find out, as we learn of the parables that Jesus is teaching, how do parables help you understand the gospel? Cindy. Yes. Well, I think um, we all like a good story. I love stories. And for me personally, I learn from them. I can ponder about those words. I can think about it on my own. And then later, while I'm thinking about it, while something happens, I'll come back to that parable and Cindy, internalize it. Cindy, what do you feel like the role of the Holy Ghost is in helping you understand some of these specific parables? For me, the Holy Ghost just opens my eyes. It brings the light. It, it teaches me internally so that I can then again speak about it a little bit more clearly, have a more personal understanding. I believe that the Holy Ghost just is my teacher. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love how, you know, as Cindy's talking about the stories help us understand. And I wanna to talk to Jen and Larry. I wanna hear some of your experiences. What sort of connections have you made working on farms and soil that help you understand some of what the Savior is trying to teach about the gospel? Well, the Sandy Vegetable Project was started back in the 80s by Alma Jones, who was the stake president at that time. And they, they were gifted this plot of land for that purpose, to have a farm to help support the members of the church and others in the neighborhood. And so the missionaries that work there, and we have senior missionaries called and they come and work there, they're very good at looking and preparing in advance, rotating the crops, putting different things in the grow boxes. And we've brought somebody down from Utah State in the past to look at the soil and analyze the soil and say, okay, what do we need? What nutrients do we need to get a better yield and to have a better product? And tying that into our own personal lives, each and every one of us needs to look at our own hearts because our heart's the soil. And what are we doing before general mm -hmm. conference? What am I doing to prepare myself? Am I reading the scriptures? Am I praying? Am I going to the temple? And do I thoughtfully partake of the sacrament each and every week to prepare myself to soften my heart so the word will grow and sprout in my own heart? And Jen, growing up on a farm, uh, what have you learned about the importance of preparing the soil and how does that align with what your husband was saying about connecting it with our hearts and preparing to receive the gospel? I think if you haven't taken the time to prepare the soil, you know, you'll be doing that right after harvest and then do it again in the spring. And if you don't take the necessary time to do that and the work, obviously there's mm -hmm. always work, but if we don't do that in our life, as well and prepare all the little things, then we aren't going to be ready to receive any information or any inspiration that we receive from our Savior. And Patrick, a lot of what they're saying falls really closely in line with what the Savior is teaching, specifically with this parable. If we look at verse 10, I love this question that is asked, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And yeah. even, even his, his disciples, they're looking at this method of, why, why do you teach like this as they start to interact and hang out with him and see 
that the way he does things is different. Yeah, and sometimes he does, you know, sometimes he gives the Sermon on the Mount, right? So, so he gives other kinds of sermons mm-hmm. too. So then they're like, what are you talking about seeds, <laughs> right? You know, uh, I actually love what he says in verse 12. He says, for whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore, I speak unto them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand. But then later in verse 16, he said, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. So parables, he says, for some people, it's just gonna be a nice story, Mm -hmm. right? And it's actually an act of mercy because they're not going to be condemned because of the teachings, right? For them, it's just a story about seeds and farming, right? But he says, for the people who have ears to hear, they're going to understand the deeper meaning. They're going to understand that this is about the gospel. So it's a kind of grace. It's a kind Mm -hmm. of gift to help them understand the gospel. So it's both an act of mercy not to condemn the unbelieving and an act of grace for the believers. It's a beautiful thing. So the Savior is going to get very specific yeah. on what some of these things mean. What is he trying to help them understand by giving them the different types of soil and planting in the seeds? Can we walk through some of those? Yeah, and that absolutely. way we can see what he's trying to teach And this them? is great because it's actually one of the few parables that the Savior interprets in detail mm-hmm. for us. So let's go to verse 18 in chapter 13 of Matthew. He says, Hear therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So that's the seed that, you know, is just thrown. It was on the road and it just doesn't take root, um, uh, doesn't go anywhere. Verse 20, but he that receives the seed into stony places, so this is rocky ground, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it, yet he hath not root in himself but endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. The seed takes root, but it's rocky ground. It doesn't have deep roots. And so when the sun comes, it withers up. You know, I love when I'm, I can't say I love pulling weeds, but (laughs) pulling weeds from the rocks is the easiest thing in the world because they just just pull right out. And so as we're talking through this, I want you to be thinking about modern representations. Think of examples of somebody receiving the gospel in rocky soil, and what does that look like versus, you know, in solid ground? Sorry, keep going. Absolutely. Verse 22, he that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, but the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So it starts to grow, but there's all these weeds that choke it out, and then it doesn't get the sunlight or the, mm-hmm. the nourishment it needs. Finally, the fourth example, verse 23, he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it and also beareth fruit. And this bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. So the good ground that's been cultivated, that's been nourished, the people who hear the word, understand it, and the bare fruit, those are the ones that are gonna produce the fruit that you want. President Oaks has a wonderful quote that goes along with that. He says, we have the seed of the gospel word. It is up to each of us to set the priorities and to do the things that make our soil good and our harvest plentiful. We must seek to be firmly rooted and converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We achieve this conversion by praying, by scripture study, by serving, and by regularly partaking of the sacrament to always have his spirit to be with us. It really is some of those small, steady things we do on a regular basis that helps us to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing uh, I didn't grow up on a farm, but uh, just from doing the little bit of gardening that I do poorly, (laughs) uh, it's not just a one-time thing, right? Mm -hmm. You got to keep paying attention to it. You don't Mm -hmm. just get to like, oh, I'm going to prepare the soil at the beginning of the spring and then I'm good, right? I mean, it's constant attention. I really believe it's every day. My dad and my brothers, they're checking the different things all the time so that they know how much water to give it or if they need fertilizer or what they really need is praying for rain. You know, that's, that's, they really believe strongly that we've had a lot of tender mercies with that help. Yeah. And depending on the care, the soil is going to get better and better over mm-hmm. the years. You know, the nutrients from the plants are left in the soil. You rotate the crops, that soil gets better and better. But if the soil is neglected, it will have the adverse effect, the mm-hmm. opposite effect, right? It'll get worse over time. So you can turn these yields from 30-fold to 60-fold to 100-fold. And one of the things I love about this that we've mentioned is that you're not stuck with rocky ground, 
rocks can be moved, right? Rocks can be taken out. Weeds can be pulled. So you can change the condition of the soil. You can change the condition of your heart. We had a question come in from one of our viewers talking about preparation of the heart. And they have a very interesting question that I would love to get your thoughts on. I'm Carter Fawcett. I'm from Layton, Utah. Um, does having an open heart mean I have to accept every word spoken by modern day prophets? Thanks. I love the way that, that Carter asked the question. Having an open heart means that you're open, right? That you're open, that you're listening. And then the Holy Ghost has been given to us to discern the words of truth. And so uh, I love that the prophets tell us over and over and over again, you don't just have to take our word for mm -hmm. it, right? You don't just have to, you know, we say you just salute and believe. You have the Holy Ghost that can confirm the truth of these words in your heart. So open yourself up to the Spirit and let God confirm to you the truth of these words. Hey, I, I like in 3 Nephi 17, the Savior has just taught the people on, this, on the American continent and he says, I perceive you're weak. Now go home, ponder on these things, pray about them and think about them, then come back. Do these things so you'll better understand and then come back and I'll give you more. And I think that goes right along with mm -hmm. what Patrick said. Yeah. I think as we're praying and as we're reading the scriptures, attending the temple and doing all of those things, if you look at his question, it says, do I have to accept everything? Once you're doing all those things, it's not a matter of having to do something. You want to do something. You want to listen to the prophets. You want to obey the things that they say because they're men of God and they know. And I think that's the change of heart right there too, just because you're doing all those things and no longer is it seem restrictive, mm -hmm. like I have to do all these things. You want to. Well, we have so much more to cover and I'm excited that we have another segment in footnotes where we can dive in even deeper into specifically this parable and the different types of soil. But what a great conversation so far. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts and for the audience, thanks for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. And for you at home, how do you prepare yourself to hear God's word? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. My favorite parable is um, the 10 virgins. My favorite parable is probably the Good Samaritan. My favorite parable is that of the prodigal son. I, there's a lot of principles there, but one of the main ones is um, the change of perspective and gratitude. I think Jesus taught in parables because it helps you remember. When someone tells you a really good story, you remember those key facts and you relate to it. And so I think he really was teaching to the people and things that they really knew and understood. Sometimes um, that those simple parable can help you to remember easily and then you can kind of pick up the ideas and you can remember the lessons behind. So it's easier to teach and easier to understand as well. We all learn in different seasons and times in our lives. I feel as a convert to the church, I just was a child at 23 trying to learn what these scriptures were. Now at 60, I feel that the Come Follow Me program, the Come Follow Up program, and those parables have a whole different meaning to me. And they are important. The second topic we're gonna to discuss today is Jesus's parables help me understand the growth and destiny of his church. Okay, Patrick, can you tell us, what do we know about these parables? Uh, specifically, what did Joseph Smith teach us about these parables in chapter 13 and what they have to do with the restoration? Yeah, so in the second half of chapter 13 of Matthew, we've got six or seven different parables, some of them really short, some of them mm -hmm. just a verse long. And Jesus says it about the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven is like or likened unto. And one of the things that Joseph Smith taught is that when Jesus was teaching this, teaching about the kingdom of heaven, this was about the church as it would go forth, especially in the restoration. So all of these we should understand uh, in reference to the kingdom of God in the last days, in reference to the church. And with this, you know, we have this modern charge to gather Israel. I want to talk to brother and sister Monson for a second and ask you, what are some of the responsibilities that you feel, uh, not only as parents and grandparents, but as leaders in the church to help gather Israel? I heard recently by General Sunday School President who made a statement that says, we have investigators at our dinner table every night. 
that are investigating the church and trying to learn. And so that's an opportunity in your own home mm -hmm. to gather, whether it's your grandchildren or your children. And then you go out as leaders of the church, you feel almost an urgency to reach out and help others. And the gathering initially spiritually, how can we help them spiritually? And then help bring them into the church and strengthen them. And I think um, as we we serve and we maybe are an example, that can be a way of gathering and hopefully others will follow and have that desire to serve. But I think starting in our own home is, is the great place to start. I know when I was Relief Society president, it was years ago, and Jackson, my son, was just a little guy. And when I'd go and check on the older ladies in my ward, I took my kids with me. And so they learned how to serve and to help. And I think that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. I think you teach through your example. So Patrick, going back to these parables, what are some of the key parables in the book of Matthew that the Savior is teaching that help us understand the growth and destiny of the church? Yes, we have several. The wheat and the tares, the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, uh, the parable of the treasure, the pearl of great price, the net, the householders. Probably the most famous of these is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Okay. And so this is one, if we go to Matthew chapter 13, it begins in verse 24. And it says, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Where did the weeds come from, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and he said, An enemy has done this. The servant said, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Should we just take them all out? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So as you listen to this parable, what are some of the initial thoughts you have on connections to this parable with some of the things that we experience today? Hey, I think one of them is you read, he didn't separate the wheat and the tares when they're small. And I think a lot of that is because you couldn't tell the difference. What's wheat, what's tear? And it says it wasn't until they came and brought forth fruit that you could distinguish between the two. And so I think today we reach out to everybody. We don't label or say, oh, that's a wheat, that's a tear, and, and try, well, I'll pull that tear out of my life because who knows, that might be a small wheat plant that's going to bless my life. And so I think we need to grow both and nourish both and then learn from the opposition. Mm -hmm that comes because there is opposition in all things. And as they get bigger, we're faced with opposition every day. I was gonna say, Jen, yeah, I mean, you had, uh, when you're talking about, you know, not pulling the, the weeds too early, I mean, you were telling mm -hmm. us a funny story early yeah. about sometimes when we get a little over eager in yes. our weeding. So um, when we were at the vegetable garden, we had gone for a little part of our youth conference and I had to chuckle because when we arrived, the kids were raking the rocks and making them look good. And it reminded me of times when I was on the farm and my dad would come up with jobs for us to do, right? Just to keep us busy. <laughs> right. So then I asked one of the missionaries, I said, so is there anything else for us to do? And they said, well, we had a family come and they weeded for us, but they took out all the carrots. So <laughs> you can no longer, we're not having anyone weed right now. <laughs> and so I think, you know, for those that aren't familiar with what the little plants look like, they didn't know the difference. And so, yes, it's best to let them grow together. And then later, as you can tell the difference, you can thin them uh, if it were carrots. But if it's the, the tares and the wheat, you need to wait until harvest. Yeah, I'll never forget a man that I knew when I was a missionary. He was just an amazing guy. He was serving in the bishopric, just kind and just, you know, served people. And he always wore long sleeve shirts, even in the middle of the summer, and I can never figure out why. And as we got to know him better, I went over to his house one time and actually he was wearing short sleeve shirts and he had tattoos all the way up and down. And we asked him about him and he said that he had spent most of his life as part of a kind of hardcore motorcycle gang. Mm. <laughs> and he had been a rough character. Mm -hmm. by, by his own account right. and done things that he was not proud of, right? And I think, you know, anybody would have looked at him and said, there's a tear. Right. But he had found the gospel. It had changed his life. He had done a complete 180. I mean, he was a disciple of Christ, 
So we just cannot look. I mean, the judgment here is the judgment at the end of the world, mm -hmm. right? It's not the, these little snap judgments <laughs> yeah. that we make all the time. It's, it's God saying, leave judgment to me. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, let me work with my children. You know, we, in this parable, as you look at it, we're talking about different people. Mm -hmm. I think each of us have wheat and tares in ourselves that we have to look at and wow. say, there's things rooted in me that aren't good, mm -hmm. that maybe I only know, nobody else knows, they're not apparent, but I'm aware of them. And early on, I may not recognize it. I may be able to justify and say, oh, that's something that's not that bad. But as I get older and it starts to come out a little bit more, I'm like, I need to change that. I need to eradicate that from my life. And so I think in our own lives, but also amongst our peers, amongst those that we work with, I, I find and take great pleasure in learning from everybody I interact with, you know, at work. And I have an opportunity at work to meet people from all different walks of life. And I learn from all of those people. And hopefully, in some small way, I'm trying to influence them. But we're sharing a common soil, mm -hmm. you know? We're all in the same place. And we need to continue to nourish the soil and do what we can. And then, as Patrick said, we leave that judgment to God. Mm -hmm. We leave that to him. That's not my place to do that. Jen? I just think it's important to love those that are around us. And I have quite a few older people in my neighborhood that I have befriended, and they're not members of the church. And some of them maybe have been baptized, but they are very inactive, but they have so many good lessons to teach mm -hmm. and they're so kind and they just want a friend and they want someone to listen to. And I think you can learn so much from everyone and be a good example and take the time to learn. But it is important that first we think of ourselves and think, what can I do to change myself and stop looking at others thinking, oh, they're the terror or, you know, because <laughs> we don't need to judge. We don't need to point fingers. Yeah. Great thoughts. I would love to hear from the audience as we talk about this parable, specifically the wheat and the tares, what are some of your thoughts on how it pertains to the growth and destiny of the church? Emily. I know that in my life, I have been judged because of my family life. And I had many people, even in the church, judge me and I would say pinpoint me as a tear. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that as I've tried my best, I have found people that have blessed my life and have seen me as wheat. And that pure love that is just like Jesus's love in my life has made me grow. And I know that if you try to help people grow rather than see them as a tear, then they will end up being a lot happier in the end. And Emily, how do you feel that the way people treated you as you grow up, how is that going to help you connect with others that may feel like they were in a similar situation? I have learned that I should not be quick to judge as others have been to me. And just to show people love, it doesn't matter who they are or how they live, just to love them and they will exponentially grow. I just want to say... Um... You know, when God looks out at this world, the, the whole world is the field. And what God sees out there is wheat, right? What God sees out there are children that he just wants to bring back to him. It's why he casts out the net. That's why the church sends out missionaries to the whole world. Because every single one of these women and men out there are daughters and sons of God that he just wants to bring back to him. That's all God wants. Thank you, Patrick. You know, it's something that Brigham Young said, you know, as we talk about who is the wheat, who are the tares, he poses a, a, a really good question. He says, and when the wheat and the tares are separated, shall I be found a tear or a wheat? Let us ask ourselves a question, am I a wheat or a tear? The proof as to whether we are tares or wheat may be seen in our lives as it is written, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Again, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And I love that it turns back to us, you know, to really focus on how are we living the gospel? How are we fulfilling our role? in the growth and destiny of the church. 
And I think that as we do that, it'll surprise us. You know, we'll we'll see that there's a lot of weed out there. Mm-hmm. You know, that unfortunately, you know, sometimes ourselves we mistake in ourselves to be tares. But the real growth from the church is going to come from people like Emily, who can relate and could connect with those. You know, because we all learn and grow in a different way. And I love the, the way this parable teaches us that for the destined church to really grow. It takes a lot, and it's going to come from a lot of different places and types of people. Yeah, exactly. It's the fruit that we put forth. I mean, the, the wheat is useful, <laughs> right? Yeah. The wheat is edifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the wheat fills people, and that's exactly what we are called to do in the church. We're to feed the world, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. literally, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly figuratively and spiritually. But we'll all experience times like Emily where we are discouraged because people maybe aren't being very kind. Mm -hmm. And we do have to just keep going. And like she said, she's found that she just tries to make a difference and tries to be better. And we just have to keep going. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts and insights uh, as we talked about and the, how the parables relate to the growth and destiny of the church. And for the studio audience, thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing your thoughts as well. For those of you at home, we still have a lot to cover from these chapters in Matthew and Luke in footnotes, so stay with us. The Spirit communicates with me in all different ways. Um, I have found I have to find those quiet moments because a lot of times it's just those small feelings and quiet feelings. I feel the Spirit most when I am singing or playing my trumpet. Um, It's through music for me, because that's one thing that I love to do. The Spirit communicates to me through thoughts or impressions. Um, I I receive these constantly and consistently when I prepare myself to receive them. We just need to listen and prepare ourselves to hear the Word. All we can do is prepare ourselves and If we're ready, then the Spirit will guide us to what we need to know and what we need to learn. When I open my eyes and heart, um, I know that like I can be a better student and better disciple of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about these chapters in Matthew and Luke with Patrick and the Monsons. Okay, well, we have some fun visuals. It's always fun to have visuals. Yeah, uh, obviously, a little show and tell. A little show and tell, <laughs> yes. Uh, and we've been talking about the, the parable of the sower, and obviously we can see the connection here with the different types of soil. And I'd like to kind of revisit and jump back in and get some of your general thoughts on either the previous conversation we had or any new details about some of these soils we have in front of us. Yeah, so right in front of us, we've got the, I mean, it's best we could do for kind of, you know, like the packed down soil where, where people walk and mm-hmm. and where all the traffic is and, and the seed's just not going to, I mean, mm-hmm. I, even I know uh, you're, 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 you're not going <laughs> to get along. You can tell. <laughs> yeah, it might be good for a road or to walk on, right? But the seed isn't going to go deep down into mm-hmm. there. Then we got rocks and you could grow something, yeah. you know, if there was a little dirt in here, but it's just, the roots aren't gonna be deep. It's not gonna be strong. It's not gonna withstand much persecution yeah. or trials or anything mm-hmm. like that, so. I, th- I think it is important that we touch on, you know, some of these different soils and what are those things that prevent that word from growing once it's been planted or sown? Well, we have the rock of doubt, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, that that true. can weigh us down. and. And, it, and it's interesting because you talk about the stony ground, and yet we're told to build on the rock, which is our Savior. Yeah. And so it's a different type of rock mm-hmm. that we need to be built on. I think of this as just like oftentimes the, the condition of my heart, the way I am towards other people. I mean, I'm hard. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm yeah. inflexible. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I, I don't give way to the seed yeah. to let it grow. I'm too rigid and stuck right. in my ways yeah. that I'm not able to yield to the Spirit. You know, something that stood out to me is in verse 5, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. So it's not only that there's rocks that are in there, but there's not enough there's not like soil. soil, there's not enough dirt. Sometimes you, you live in a, in a world where you cannot avoid those rocks because right. they're going to be there. It's everywhere. just part of mortality. That's right. So what's some of the good soil that we can fill so that we can kind of drown out so these rocks are really irrelevant? 
I mean, I think in, in our garden, I mean, it's not a big farm, uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, every so often, even, you know, every, every spring you got to bring in new topsoil, right? I mean, you right, know, the, the, the soil just does kind of get compacted. It gets, you know, you got to plow it up. You got to do other things. But sometimes you got to introduce new soil. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we do with our daily practices. This is why, you know, a reason to go to church. This is why we do service for other people. In some ways, all of that is partly removing the rocks, but it's also introducing new <laughs> soil that we can cultivate. That's one of my job. We have a garden in our house. <laughs> my wife, she could spend all day outside. And my job is just to get the new soil of the tiller and mix it all in, you know. Uh, Read the muscle behind that's it. That's right. <laughs> I just let the thing drive itself. <laughs> but it really does. And, and something that I found interesting that maybe you can speak to this, Jen, with your experience on a farm. Sometimes we'll plant something in one spot. And then the next year, we'll plant it in a different spot. What is the purpose of kind of shifting and, and what do we learn about preparing the soil as it relates to preparing our hearts when it comes to receiving and nourishing the Word of God? I think just like with soil, you think of people, right? And as you interact with different people, each of them have something different to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Just like we're here together talking. Same thing with the different crops that you're growing. Each of them have a different nutrient that they add. So then the next year, it's going to be good for another crop. But you have to make sure that most of the time you rotate through so that the next year's crop can benefit from what the last one mm -hmm. did. And so you can think of that in families, in wards and stakes. You know, there is strength in numbers. And I think it's awesome when people can grow and learn from each other. And I think one of the things when we talk about rotating crops, as Jen said, you get nutrients and, you know, benefit from the prior, you know, harvest. But if you plant the same thing in the same soil over and over, your yield becomes less. And I think of this as if we get fixated on one part of the doctrine mm -hmm. or one part of the church, and that's where we are, our yield might have been great, but it's going to be less and less and less as we do that, because that's the only thing that we've planted is that one particular part of the doctrine. Along with this, like if you are planted on stony ground or within the rocks or in weeds, that doesn't mean that's where you're going to stay, right? Yeah. I think the same thing goes with being planted in good soil. In Alma chapter 5, you know, uh, Alma talking about the change of the heart and how once you get into this soil, we have to be really careful. And I love in verse 26, he's asking the question, I say unto you, my brethren, if you have experienced a change of heart. If you have the good soil, if at one point in your life you were here and have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, you've produced good fruit, I would ask, can you feel so now? Is it still there? Are we getting complacent? Are we cultivating each year, adding in new soil? What are some of the cautions that the Savior is trying to teach about once you're in the good soil, you've got to stay there and continue to nourish it? I think sometimes you hear, you know, we've been there, done that. We don't need to do that again, you know, but sometimes you do. You have to find the things that bring you joy and that bring you closer to Christ and you need to keep doing them. And if we aren't in a good place and we're not experiencing that, we need to find what once made us that way and do it again. Yeah, I mean, we we feed our bodies every day, right? Uh, we we recognize this principle in terms of you can't just plant a garden once, or you mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, this takes repetitive work. It takes you know attention to it, you know, th throughout the day, throughout the months, throughout the years. It's it's not just a one time thing. And mm -hmm. again, I did I didn't grow up on a farm. I I can imagine that that there are some days you just don't want to get out of bed, right? There are some days like I did this yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. But also farmers know or gardeners know if if I don't do that, entropy is real, right? Yeah. I mean, this thing is is going to kind of fall apart. It's going to decay. And this is one of the lessons that the Savior teaches us here is, right, if, if you don't nourish these things, if you don't give attention to these things, you're going to lose even what you have. You, you can't yeah. just stay on a plateau. Mm -hmm. You're either going like this mm -hmm. or you're going like this. Okay, give us an example. What are some of the things that you do to cultivate and nourish the good soil that you have built and developed over years of living the gospel? I think you know, you look at service, you okay. look at scripture study, prayer. I think a big one is we got to participate in ordinances and covenants, whether it's the renewing of our covenants with the sacrament, going to the temple, et cetera. All that is helping to nourish our soil. And as Patrick says, if we neglect that, I mean, 
we have to have routines or there are certain things that we farmers have to do to the soil. You know, from the time you plant all the way to your harvest and then at the, after the harvest, you have to tend to the soil and till it under and prepare it for the next spring. And so if you do neglect it, it's easy for weeds mm -hmm. to come in. And we know weeds in a field come quick, just like weeds in our lives come quick. Mm -hmm. If we let our guard down, if we are not consistently doing something, weeds are gonna grow. Okay. And I think that some things have to be scheduled. I think too often, you know, you'll make time to go to the show, you'll make time to play pickleball or whatever the case is, <laughs> but are we taking the time to read? Are we taking the time to go to the temple? Are we taking time to find the things that are bringing us closer to Christ and to fill the Spirit more in our lives? And so as we do those things, then our soil will be ready for that seed. So I want to talk about this this uh, next cup yeah. here. So I mean, it kind of maybe it looks like a nice little plant or something like that. These are actually weeds that we just picked. And we have the thorn. There's a little yeah. thorn yeah. If, if, yeah. if you can see it. So this is kind of the next type of soil, and Jesus interprets this for us in verse 22 of chapter 13 of Matthew, where he says that he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. I mean, you, we, we've got some good green stuff here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's producing. And the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Mm -hmm. Right? So there is growth, but there is all this other stuff, mm -hmm. these kinds of accretions and these kinds of thorns, these other things that come up around that good plant that is mm -hmm. growing, and it chokes it out. I love that phrase, the deceitfulness of riches, in, in the sense that riches, that's what they do. They deceive us. Mm -hmm. They feel so important. Right? They feel like something that you can build your life on. They feel so mm -hmm. fruitful, right? Mm -hmm. And the Savior is saying here, that's deception. Those are the things that can choke out the good seed. That really lines up with another parable that the Savior teaches in this chapter about mm -hmm. the pearl of great price. What mm -hmm. sort of connection can we make with this idea of being choked out by this deceitful pursuit of riches and what the Savior is trying to teach of what really has value and worth in our lives? Yeah, I don't know. Jen, do you want to maybe read that? Like uh, 45 46, and 46? 46. Yeah. Uh -huh. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found the pearl, one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So here it's riches, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And But it's kind of a different message here of when you find the thing that matters the most, right? That you're willing to sacrifice everything, everything all these other things that you realize are not worth as much mm -hmm. as even that one pearl of great price. I mean, that's that's what we named one of our books of scripture yeah, right. uh, <laughs> after that. That's where that comes from, is from this line in, in the New Testament. And this is a message that given, of course, where the Savior is in his ministry with his apostles and with his disciples, that's going to be really difficult for some of them to learn that once you find you should be willing to give up everything. I mean, he asked this of Simon and Andrew, you know, just leave everything you have and come follow me. And then we see, you know, with the other example with the young rich man, how he says, look, I've done everything. Well, have you really, you know, go sell everything you have. So what he's asking us to do, that's a lot, but it is the value that we place on it that really matters. And as we view the gospel of Jesus Christ as something so precious, then we would be willing to obtain it and to hold on to it. The price is the same for everybody, right? It's everything you have. You might have a little mm -hmm. and you might have a lot, but it the Lord's asking, just give up at all. Mm -hmm. Well, and, 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 and the temptation comes for those who have a lot is yeah. that those cares of the world, right? Sometimes yeah. that, that- The deceit the, of riches just, that you can buy your happiness with this. Exactly, mm -hmm. that's harder to give up. And I don't know, you know, in your long experience in, in the church, have, have you seen that in a way that sometimes, I mean, other things just crowd out yeah. the good seed that's there. I mean, yeah. good, good people, right? Mm -hmm. Who have done good things, but then other cares of the world come in and crowd that out. Yeah, I mean, things start to, you know, occupy your time. Your priority. And they become your priority. And, that, you know, and as the Savior said, where you put your time, that's where your heart is. Yeah. And you see that with people. And, and it kind of waxes and wanes in yeah. some people's lives. You I've know? felt that at times in my life, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Other things have overtaken, mm -hmm. for sure. You, you know, in, this, in the hymn, Come Thou Fount, you know, prone to wander. Mm -hmm. Lord, I feel it. I think all of us have that tendency to want to wander a little bit. But when we do give our all, and the Lord knows that we do, and that's when we're the happiest. Mm -hmm. If we think about it, if we're serving and doing those things. I, I know Jen 
at times, you know, years ago, I'd say, oh, I'm, things would get so frustrating. I'd go, I'm just not happy. She goes, if you're not happy, you're not serving. Mm. So get out and serve. Mm -hmm. And that would always be the ticket to change your heart is to but go out and serve. Get going in the right way. Okay, so it's not always those happy moments. And it can be really, <laughs> really taxing, right? Yeah. And it can be really challenging, and especially in a calling that, you know, as busy as being a stake president and being a Relief Society president. So can you think of some specific times where you have those little moments where maybe things aren't so busy or where you really find that joy from serving in a calling? I think when you see people change, you know, people say, well, what's the difference between a stake president and a bishop? And I said, well, bishop deals with a lot. Stake president, we see the best of the best and then the toughest things <laughs> within the stake. And it can be spiritually taxing, but then you don't remember that. You remember the joyful things where you see people's lives change and people that have either come into the church or were reactivated and went to the temple and now you see the joy in them. And that just brings you joy to say, my brothers and sisters are, are experiencing the same thing I am and have the same blessings that I have. Jen? Mine hasn't always been that maybe people are reactivated, but I think that as I have seen um, people come together and to be kind and look out for one another, I have found a lot of joy in that. And I just think so many people have so much good and they really have a lot to give, I think, all of us. It has brought me a lot of joy as I just am with them, mm -hmm. actually, and serve them. Okay, Patrick, I have a, I have a question for you. There's a difference from the Matthew account and the Luke account of the parable of the sower that I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. In the Matthew 13 account, it starts out with the Savior going out by the seaside, the multitude gathers, he goes into the ship. And then he gives the parable of the sower. In the Luke 8 account, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Starting in verse 1, he went throughout every city and village preaching. And then in verse 2, we get a little more information. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Verse 3, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. We have this unique mention of, of these specific women, and then he goes into the parable of the sower. Right. Is there any significance to in the Luke account of mentioning these women, and what can we learn from that? Yeah, it is, and it's important for us to remember that these gospels are written after the fact. Mm -hmm. These are not like the firsthand like diary right. accounts mm -hmm. of what's going on. I mean, these are actually written decades after the fact, oftentimes based on the stories that people Ooh. told. And so there's a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. these gospels, but sometimes some of the details are just a little bit different because of people's memories or the way that the authors are setting up the story, okay. the things that they want to emphasize. But I love, one of the things about Luke is one of the reasons that I think it might be my favorite gospel. <laughs> I, know, I know we're probably not supposed to have a favorite of the four, but Luke might be my favorite. But he gives so much attention to women. Okay. Uh, women are prominently displayed in Luke's gospel. And we see this here that we talk about the 12, we talk about the disciples that Jesus has gathered with him, but that includes these women. They are central to Jesus's ministry. They're going to be central to the church that Paul builds and that the apostles build, you know, the early Christian church. And here we see, I love these first few verses because it just shows, you know, Jesus talked about casting a net, right? Mm -hmm. And then just reeling them in. And this is what we see in these first few verses. He is obviously reeled in the 12. We understand that. But all of these different women through healings and, and through different things, people have followed him. But then Joanna, who's the wife of one of Herod's stewards, right? So Herod's always the bad guy, but this is one of like the top officers, a kind of a chief of staff in Herod for this political leader. And his wife is with him. So an elite person. And then many others that ministered to him. So, so Jesus is casting a wide net here. And so when he's preaching, he's not just preaching to the 12, he's preaching to multitudes mm -hmm. of people who come from every background, rich and poor, men and women, and these parables are for everybody. And I think Luke pays attention to that more than any of the other gospel writers. As a woman, I, you know, it was always great to be thought of, right? Absolutely. So I think that that is always good to hear. And I think in so many stories in the Bible, you find women of such great faith. And there were women that had done some bad things, but yet mm -hmm. they were still loved. And I think that's so neat to see that, you know, everyone is a child of God and everyone is thought of and they're going to help them. 
And I think a lot of times the women are closer to the spirit. Mm -hmm. And they, they might have recognized truth quicker than the men at that time did. And so I think, you, you know... At that I, time? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I was just trying to pull up because I know, didn't Sister Burton or somebody give a talk in conference called Certain Women mm -hmm. and talked about, throughout the scriptures, they refer to certain women and how they blessed the lives of the Savior, but they blessed the lives of all those that they were around at that time. And I love one of the other little differences between Matthew's and Luke's account here. If we go to verse 15 of Luke, when he talks about the good ground, he says that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. This idea of an honest and a good heart. And especially in terms of the way that he set this up, it's like, I don't care where you've come from. I don't care if you were possessed with seven demons, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care if you are rich, if you're poor, if you're a man, if you're a woman. Like, here's the word, and then will you receive it with a good and honest heart? That's, mm -hmm. that's all he asks. That's all matter. And anybody can do that. And they added with patience too, right? With patience. With, and right. I mean, that's, that's big because... Nothing happens just like that. Yeah. I think a lot of the youth right now think that everything is instantly gratified, but it's <laughs> not. You know, you have to put forth a lot of effort and patience. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes weeds grow faster than good mm -hmm. stuff, right? And so, again, these agricultural metaphors, they, they worked for the people then because <laughs> they understood it, but they work for us now because you yeah. recognize you put in that work, you don't get an ear of corn the next day, yep. right? You, you, you got to wait. Work. Uh, yeah, you you got to yeah, work yeah. and you got to be patient. Wait for it to come in its own due time. As we talk about the teachings of Jesus, the parables, to those that are watching that maybe they feel like they're, you know, planted in rocky soil or among the weeds, give us a thought or a message to encourage us to really seek that good ground to accept the good word of God. I just really feel strongly that we can change. Maybe you don't have the greatest soil right now, or there's little things that we can tweak. We can add to our lives whatever we need to. And if we need to feel more of the Spirit, we need to do the things that would help us to do so. And not just hearing the Word, but we need to hearken. And I think I've loved that word this year. Just we need to actually do these things too. We can't just say, oh yeah, that's right. I need to do this. Mm -hmm. We really do need to do it. And as we do that, we will have a change of heart and we will be able to do so many things because he'll be with us. Well, everybody's heard the saying, grow where you're planted, mm -hmm. right? And as I've thought about this as we've discussed this, but regardless of what soil we're in, what's the one thing that can help us grow is water and the living water of the Savior. And so if we invite the living water of the Savior, even in the hard ground, the water will soften that ground. And the living water of the Savior can soften our hearts. If we're in stony grounds, as we talked about, we little by little remove the stones. If we're in thorny ground, we continue to grow and get rid of those thorns and weeds that are in our lives. And if we're in good soil, we have to continue to grow and thrive in that. But I think the living water of the Savior, and then realizing that we always have to get more soil. Mm -hmm. We have to bring in that topsoil. So if we're here, we got to bring soil because we mentioned there wasn't enough soil for it to go. We get rid of rocks, we bring in soil, we loosen soil. And so that, that's what I think. Well, thank you both so much for sharing of your, your experiences and just your goodness uh, with us today. Patrick, it's always great to work with you. Thanks, and ben, just, you too. <laughs> I'm amazed at what you know and the time and study you've put in. So thank you so much for all of you for contributing to this discussion today. And for those at home, thank you for joining us from this discussion from Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 8, and Luke chapter 13. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions you've received. For additional study and teaching resources, visit byutv.org slash comefollowup. Next week, join us in our discussion of faith over fear, using our God-given gifts and more as we study Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 5-6. through 6. Thank you for watching.